this video is going to be a bit different. I wanted to talk about the new experimental NPR branch. I want to explain the new tools that it adds. And then I want to do some more like brief breakdowns over random doodles that I've made with it. Effects that aren't like as polished or complete, but things that should hopefully inspire other people to create cool stuff with these new tools and to show like the range of capabilities that we have with these new tools. Uh, first of all, the NPR branch is like super experimental early alpha, so a lot of this is subject to change. I think a lot of the principles that I'm teaching will still apply, which is why I don't want to do something like super in-depth right now. But we can also expect to see more features added in the future. Usually when you're doing stylized stuff, you probably want to use the standard view transform. This is something I haven't really mentioned in previous videos, but it's something that I do to get more accurate colors. You don't really want to use a tone mapper like AGX, unless you're going for this like physically based rendering with realistic light values. So while we do have new shader features like repeat zones, the actual NPR nodes are a separate node tree that happens after this surface shading for your object. You can click new on the material output to add a new NPR tree here, and then you can go from object to NPR to open your NPR tree. We have an NPR output here, which is the color, and this NPR input, which has a bunch of our shader passes, like the combined color, diffuse color, diffuse direct lighting, etc. Most of these are more applicable if you're using like a principled shader, but we also have things like position and normal, which are going to be very helpful later. You may also notice that these sockets are purple instead of yellow. This means that they aren't exactly colors. You can actually sample these sort of like an image texture here, where you can offset this image sample in screen space like this. You'll notice that there are two options here, view and pixel. Pixel just offsets it based on these like pixel coordinates where view is independent from the resolution. But you'll also notice that when you set it to view, you may see some weird distortion. The reason this happens is because if you select the view option, then this offset is actually divided by the depth of the scene. And what this means is that if our dragon is moved further away like this, the distance that it's offset in the screen space is going to be proportionate to how far away it is, which means because it's further away, it's going to be offset less. This is actually really useful for a lot of effects, but the difference between these two things is something to keep in mind. If I set this to pixel, for example, and offset the dragon by some amount, you can see that it changes based on whether or not I'm in full screen, and also the distance that the dragon in the back is offset is the same in screen space even though it like looks like it has been offset more because it's further away. Now, I've kind of used this in previous videos, like my iridescent tutorial, to create this like rim highlight effect, and we're gonna go ahead and recreate that, but I'm gonna explain it a bit more in depth. Unfortunately, the NPR input here doesn't have a way to sample the depth of our scene, but we can get around that by looking at our position and using a vector transform node set to point and converting it from world to camera space. If you separate the Z, you'll see that we have our scene depth here. We want to take the dragon and offset it slightly in screen space, and then check the difference between the depth of our offset dragon and our unoffset dragon. If there aren't very big changes in depth, then there hasn't been a large change in the geometry there, but if there was a large change in depth, then it usually means that there was an edge there. This is how pretty much all edge detection algorithms work, and we can use this edge detection to create a cool like rim light around our dragon. I'm going to duplicate the vector transform node and look at the position with no offset here. And we want to just subtract these from each other. Now as I offset our dragon, you can see that we can kind of detect edges. Now if we're using this edge detection for stylized room lighting, we want the set to view instead of pixel. That way the thickness of this edge stays consistent with how far the object is from us, and also isn't dependent on the scene resolution. You can use a greater than node to threshold this edge detection now, and what this is doing is saying if the difference between the depth and the offset depth is greater than some amount, then that will mark an edge. If this threshold is lower, then more edges will appear on your model. And if it gets higher, you're going to approach the sort of silhouette-based edge lighting. I'll keep it as like a silhouette thing for now, just to make this a bit more readable. But what if we want this edge lighting to actually react to the lights in the scene? Luckily, NPR Nodes adds this really cool for each light zone, which is very similar to the repeat zone, except for the iteration count, it just loops over every light that would affect a respective pixel. Usually that means if you have two lights in your scene, it'll loop two times. But if you're working with point lights, for example, then it's not going to loop over a point light if it's outside the radius of that respective point light, for optimization reasons, of course. You don't need to know that lighting information if it's not going to affect that pixel. This is really cool though, because we have access to a whole lot of lighting information, like color, direction, distance, attenuation, and shadow mask. If I were to just 
plug the shadow mask into the output here and look at the output of our 4 each light loop. It's going to show this black and white shadow mask for a single light source here. And if I duplicate this light, it's not going to show the shadow mask for the second light source. And the reason for that is because whatever we're putting here is kind of just overwriting whatever came before it. When we loop over our first light, the output goes into here, and we can actually see that output again here, but we aren't using that in this case. So we're just looking at the shadow mask for the last light that we looped over. Blender loops over the lights in a specific order, going from the furthest of the camera to the closest, which means if we orient our camera to be like this, we're actually going to look at the shadow map for the nearest light now. If we multiply the shadow map by, say, 0.5, and then add it with our previous shadow map, you can now see that we're rendering both shadow maps for our lights, and wherever the shadow maps are both at 0.5, they're summing up to 1, so we can get this sort of tune lighting here. For the record, this probably isn't how you'd actually do tune lighting, I'm just demonstrating how the light loop works. But obviously there are a lot of ways that you can go about stylized lighting, and that's for you to experiment with. Let's get rid of that though, and our second light source, and I'm just going to move all of our rim light stuff down here. And we want the light direction to influence how our rim light is offset in screen space. Using a vector transform node, we can convert this direction into camera space. And I'm going to set this to normal, just because our light direction is going to be normalized anyway, so it doesn't really matter. I'm going to use a scale node to multiply this vector, and then I'm going to plug it into our image offset here. Currently we're offsetting it way too much, so I'm going to set this to something like 0 0.01. If we look at just our offset position now and scale this, you can see that it's kind of moving away from our light source even as we move it around, which means this rim highlight is also going to react to our light source. I'm going to multiply this by the color of our light, that was the actual color of the light affects it, and I'm going to sum up all iterations of this as well, so multiple lights will affect it. If I now duplicate this light source, if I change our light to a reddish color, you're going to see that the colors don't really line up with whatever you're setting it. They're kind of white unless you go completely saturated, and the reason for that is because the strength of your light is being multiplied on top of this color. To fix this, you can just set the power to 1 so we're not multiplying it by anything, but now we're going to notice a new issue, being that our rim light doesn't show up at all. That's because the strength of our light also influences the distance that our point light will cast light at. If we move it really close to our dragon, you can see that the rim light shows up in a radius around it. To set our own radius, we just check custom distance here, and you want to set this to some large value. And now you can see that our dragon is actually affected by this lighting here. If we duplicate our light and add a new one, and maybe change the color of it, you can see that it's all reacting correctly. And you can even go as far as to change the blending mode for your lighting with this add node at the end. If you want this to be a bit more intuitive, you can also use the color mix node for these things. They do the same thing, doesn't really matter. If you set this to maximum, for example, then having multiple red lights won't actually brighten the red at all, because you're just going to pick the lightest values for each pixel instead of summing them up. And this is the same as using the light and blend mode on the color mix node. If we try adding this to our mixed color, then sometimes it just doesn't like to work. You can get around this by duplicating your NPR output and plugging in a combined color here that is unrelated to the one being read in the for each light loop. I kind of assume this is a bug, but this is the workaround that I found for it. And you'll notice that our actual point lights are really dim now because we set the strength really low to avoid them blowing out the colors of our rim lighting here. You can manually darken the rim lighting, manually brighten the diffuse, but what I expect most people to do is use rim lighting like this with stylized shader setups to begin with, which means you're probably going to be using the light loop to create custom lighting. Now I just want to show some other cool things that I've made with NPR nodes to show how far you can really push these new tools. This is the custom translucent shader I made in Blender. It's based off this GDC talk from a really long time ago actually. It's a real-time translucency effect that was intended for like game engines and just general real-time use. If I look at the colors without any of the NPR shading and just the combined color by itself, it looks like this. Uh, we actually do have a little bit of sort of subsurface scattering, and that's because I'm using Blender's built-in subsurface scattering node here. And if I try changing the scale of this to be similar to what we had before, you can see it just looks really blurry and noisy and you lose a lot of detail. If we compare that to the translucency I made by itself, it looks like this. And this is not designed to be like a replacement for subsurface scattering. Each algorithm for this kind of thing has its own pros and cons, and this is kind of just a practice to get more familiar with the light loop. It's cool though, as you can move these lights around and even put them inside the object like this. Now, something that I'm doing here is actually using a geometry node setup to bake a sort of thickness map. It's a really naive and slow approach, but I just bake it out anyway, so it doesn't really matter here. And I'm using that for the translucency. 
Obviously, if you want a more real-time approach, you could use ambient occlusion set to inside, for example. I just think this doesn't look as good, and I wanted to have a more accurate thickness map that didn't rely on any, like, screen space effects or noise or anything like that. You can also see that I'm using an AOV output here. This is a really cool feature of NPR nodes, where you can actually have these custom AOV outputs and read them in your NPR tree. So you can see up here, I'm actually separating the XYZ here, so I can read both the thickness map here and the ambient occlusion. Which are both influencing the lighting. Something really cool is that because I sum this up with the combined colors to create this interesting material, I guess, you actually don't have to use subsurface scattering here. If you wanted to use something like glass, for example, this also creates a really cool look. I think it looks sort of like ice because ice has a lot of air bubbles and thus subsurface scattering or translucency in addition to the refractive material. And I know I said before that you generally want to use standard for NPR stuff, but this isn't really an NPR shader. Like, it's not as physically based as using something like cycles, and it's like a very fake approach to translucency. But this is a setting where you're using like realistic light brightnesses and things, so you actually do want to use a tone mapper like AGX. If I set this to standard, it just looks horrible. Another shader I made is this fur rendering. It does this kind of parallax effect, except instead of sampling just an image texture, it's actually sampling the screen texture itself. So we can keep Suzanne's super low poly here, but do this really interesting fur rendering with a lot of depth. This is vaguely inspired by how Path of Exile 2 does their fur rendering, which you can see in this talk right here. This talk also just has a lot of really cool technical art and inspirations if you want to take a look. I highly recommend it. And this effect here actually uses the repeat zone. If I disable dithering here, you can actually start to see the individual layers for a parallax, and we can change the number of layers using this value right here. By using white noise to dither our layers, we can make it much harder to see the actual visible layering, and instead we'll just get more or less noise depending on how many iterations we use. I came up with this when I tried to use screen space normals to offset how we are sampling the image texture here, and I noticed that it almost looks like it's creating this interior shell. This is really cool because a lot of parallax math tends to be more complicated than this is, and this was like a really simple way to get visually a very similar result. So I'm not doing a lot of fancy math here, it's probably not a technically correct approach to screen space parallax, but I think it looks good enough for what it is. Like all real-time techniques, and especially screen space effects, this isn't without its caveats, but but it was just a practice to better understand how NPR nodes work and create some cool stuff with it. And obviously there are a lot of contexts where something like this might be something that you want to use. Now I also created this cool painterly shader that does some really cool lighting effects. The issue is that because this is a very experimental Blender build, um, unfortunately if I try to open the file now it just crashes. So definitely be careful about using really early experimental alphas like this. I do still want to talk about one of the really cool aspects of this being how the custom lighting has this cool hue shift effect. Where like red lights might become more purple as they get darker and yellow lights might become more orange as they get darker to emulate how you might do like stylized coloration with shadows and paintings. And the coolest part about this is it works with any light color, but you have a lot of artistic control over how different colors actually hue shift. So to explain this, let's first start with a bunch of points and we're going to map these points uh, in like 3D space based on their color. For example, black is going to be at 0, 0, 0 because that's its RGB values, white is going to be at 1, 1, 1, etc. And what you end up with is something like this. As we increase the number of points, you can imagine how all of our possible RGB values are technically contained within this cube. Because any color that your screen can display is between 0 and 1 in the red, green, and blue channels. This is called an RGB cube, and understanding it is important for understanding how our hue shifting is going to work. I've got another RGB cube here set up, just with a simple shader, and if we separate the X, Y, and Z, you can see that it goes between 0 and 1 on all three axes. And now we're going to do something called trilinear interpolation. I'm going to add four color mix nodes using the X value for the factor of all four of them. Because the X represents our red channel, then where X is 0, we want to have no red, and where X is 1, we want to have red. So for each of these mix nodes, we're going to use different sets of colors where red goes from 0 to 1. For example, we might go from black to red here. In this one, we might go from green to yellow. 
Here we'll go from blue to magenta. And last we'll go from cyan to white. So we have all of these key colors going from no red to red for each of these mixed nodes. Now we're going to add more mixed nodes and we want to blend between these two first. This one has no grain and this one has 100% grain. So we want to mix between these based on our green channel here. And it's the same with this one. This one has no grain. This one has 100% grain. So we mix between these with our green channel as well. And last, because this group up here has no blue and this group down here does have blue, we want to mix between these final mix nodes using our blue channel. And what you should see is that nothing changes. Our RGB cube should look exactly the same as it looks before. What's cool about this though is if I were to go ahead and change this blue color for example, you can see that this corner of the cube changes and it blends in super smoothly with all of the other colors. Now because we're only using the RGB cube to visualize this, if we go ahead and replace our generated coordinates here with an image texture, now if we change the black to say something like a bright blue, anything that used to be 100% black is now going to be this exact blue color, and anything that approaches that black color is going to smoothly blend into it. Likewise, if we change our red to be more cyan, then Anything that used to be red is now going to be cyan. We can change magenta to maybe green. And you can see that this gives us a lot of control over changing our color using these sort of key colors. This is how I did the shadow colors for my painterly shader. Depending on the light color, you would run it through this to determine what the shadow colors for that light would be. And then you had a lot of artistic control because you could say, oh yeah, red gets darker, of course, but it also gets a bit more purplish, maybe. Green maybe turns a bit more cyan, white maybe gets a bit more bluish like this, uh, etc. And you can see how doing something like this gives you a lot of artistic control over how you can change the colors, and thus how any light color gets darker. Because you're interpolating for every single possible color, uh, this works with any light color. It doesn't just work with these specific key colors but you can like really fine tune how different colors hue shift, which is really cool. After cleaning up the files a bit, I'm going to throw the rim light effect, the translucent effect, and the fur rendering effect on my gumroad for free to use as like an educational resource. They aren't very polished or anything, but if you want to like see how they work a bit more in depth and experiment with them and do your own thing, then those are there for you to grab if you'd like. And I know this video is a bit different. Um, I don't plan on stopping tutorials. I have ideas for tutorials that I would still like to do. Um, I just wanted to show off the NPR branch and some things that I've made with it. And I felt like none of these really worked very well for an in-depth tutorial like the ones that I've done in the past. So I hope this was still like educational. You could still learn something from this and I hope it inspires people to go out and experiment with the NPR branch and make their own cool stuff. But uh, thank you so much for watching and bye bye